June marks the 44th annual Black Music Month, as well as the 53rd anniversary of Pride Month. Here at the Chris David Show, we're celebrating by bringing you exclusive interviews with people who are making momentous contributions to Black music, as well as highlighting LGBTQ plus creatives. With inspiration from artists such as Prince, David Bowie, Grace Jones, Depeche Mode, and George Clinton, this Brooklyn duo have fully encompassed intersectionality through their fusion of funk, house, disco, and synth pop, creating futuristic, hypnotic, pulsating positivity for the planet. Please give a warm, no, hot, Chris David Show welcome to the illustrious Blacks. Hey. Welcome, man child. Welcome, monster. Thank you both so much for coming by. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Now, these are the illustrious Blacks, everyone. We have Manchild all the way over there to my left or right. I don't know which one. I don't know if it's left or right. No, I know it's you, but I'm just saying, I don't know if it's my left or right on, on the camera. And then beside Manchild, we have Monster Black right here. So right, right beside me, that's Monster Black. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> let's let's jump right in though. I want to jump right in. How did you two get into music? Man child, you go first. Oh my gosh. Music. Well, my first love was actually theater. Theater. And um I started as an actor and did a lot of musical theater, but I always loved music and just writing songs as a hobby. And um once I I did a lot of theater in the D.C. area, but also in New York. And um, one day I just decided, you know what? I, I want to be able to cre create on my own terms, um, not wait for a casting director or someone to say, hey, you should play this role. I wanted to be able to create for myself. So I started a, a band and started to um, co-write songs with a musician and perform around New York. And um, and that was really my my foray into the music world, the first iteration. <laughs> now, what was that band called? I'm just curious. What was that band called? <laughs> wow, uh, it was called <laughs> it was called Urban Fol Folklore. Urban Folklore. Yeah, it was myself and a good friend of mine, and we um, started a band, and uh, it was kind of a neo soul kind of funk. Band and we performed everywhere. It was really it, good, really oh, good. You're, he's, he's yeah. being very sweet. <laughs> One of these yeah. days, you're going to have to dig into those archives and bring some of that out because I want to hear and see some of that. That's Definitely. what I keep saying. I usually leave the past oh. in the past, but uh, for, for you, we'll, okay. we'll do something. But wait a minute, for me, but not for Monster. Monster just said that's what he keeps saying. I see that. Well, he, you heard Monster, it here. Monster experienced it the first time around. Okay. Okay. You understand? So he's, he's heard it. Got you. <laughs> um, I see. Well, yes. go on, my fellow Scorpio Moon over there, uh, Monster. Go on and tell us what was your first, uh, you know, experience with music. To, like music? Um, yes. Well, long story short, I would have to start back to um, the 1800s. <laughs> I don't have to go back to... <laughs> Listen, he said it, I didn't. Right, I know, right? Being that toddler toddler who responded immediately to Stevie Wonder and James Brown. Um, so it started um, then, uh, my love for music, because my physical response to them was immediate and my parents recognized that. So they encouraged me to dance all the time. And then I started performing as a dancer skater probably at the age of five and then, then so like the dance world took over but with the idea that I had in my head that to be able to move forward in the music world that I wanted to move forward in I needed to really hone on um, a choreographic the choreographic skill that I had because the vision that I had in my head 
was coming from a different place from what I'd already seen um, happening in terms of being able to create these worlds for the stage with my music. Um, now, I mean, yeah, so that that started happening though, like around undergrad where I started seeing that happening from pop artists that were already pop artists, but you know, so that was kind of my introduction. Then I had a band, I started having a band um, around, um, I lived in DC for a while and I started creating, um, I would create these performance art pieces where I would pretty much produce and compose the music. And then I started incorporated live musicians somewhere around that same time. Now, what was your band called? Oh my God, there's been so many bands. Um, the 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 first um the first ones were there was a band called Ten Dot M and there was a band called Bang Bang Machine and then once they got to New York it became oh it was um Monster Black and the Sonic Leroy that was hmm. probably the band that I had actually Monster Black and the Sonic Leroy. Oh, yeah. Nice. I'm like, listen, I'm feeling these names. Like, I they just, these names are just the whole, just entire mood for me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because I don't, you, you, you are my first musical guest. I have not had any musical guest on yet. So, like, yeah. and I love music. So, like, this is just like, I'm in my element right now. So, it's yeah, just history. forgive me. I'm fanning out a little bit. I'm just forgive me. Um, by the way, man child, what's your sign? What's your zodiac sign? I am a Sagittarian. Are you? Yeah. And I like long walks in the park and <laughs> no, yeah, acts of service. Acts of service. That's my love language, actually. <laughs> nice. Are you November or December? December. Oh, okay. So and you're my, a Sag, you know, you're a real Sag. I am. And fun fact, my both my parents are Sages. And our dog growing up was a Sag. So it was a house really? of Sag. And you and your dad nice. share we share the same birthday. My dad and I. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I bet that was really interesting. But you know what I love where this is going? Because speaking of Sages, we recently lost an icon, a legend, a star, a statement, Tina Turner, the Tina Turner. I want you to tell everyone why Tina's contribution was so important, not just to Black music, but to music as a whole. I thought it was whoever, the whoever wants to go first. Oh, the whoever does. Oh, okay. God. The Sag can go first, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. We could talk for hours about Tina Turner and the importance and significance of her. I mean, this is a woman who continued to, I mean, let's face it, rock and roll is Black music. It came from Black people. And this is someone who continued that tradition well into uh, up until she retired, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately with um, a rock and roll, it, it, you know, some things shifted and, uh, you know, there are many people in the population who don't understand that rock and roll was created by black people. And so she is significant to me specifically because she, again, she, she um, continued to center that in her musical style all throughout her career. And so she, in fact, is, to me, the undisputed uh, queen of rock and roll. I'll just piggyback off of that, along with her being the queen of rock and roll. Her overall aesthetic um, that also includes her movement style when she's performing, um, that was one of the reasons why I gravitated towards her as well because of her ability to also be super physical while performing and singing amazingly on stage. And you can still hear her breath as she moves, meaning that she's not lip syncing. <laughs> Is that <laughs> because if you're going to dance and sing at the same time, you're going to hear it in your breath. Hope y'all paying attention to what Monster <laughs> just said. And I'm, you listen, we're not going to name names. It just is what it is. But I hope y'all yeah. are paying attention. And you know, I'll tell you really quickly what I liked about her was the fusion. 
because she fused so many different styles and so many different genres together. And it, it was just effortless. Speaking of, you two just fused so many different styles and genres together as well. Like, I literally can't think of anyone who sounds like you. So what inspired that? I think it comes from um, just our, both of our upbringings. I mean, when we met, we really bonded over music. That was one of the things that, that brought us together. Um, and we shared a lot of the same taste. So when he speaks of James Brown and Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson and Prince, I mean, these are people I also grew up on, but also we were children of the, the you know, of an earlier time where there was a lot of new wave, there was a lot of um, funk. And so, and we met together, you know, dancing to house music. Mm -hmm. So there was all of these things um, musically that inspired us. So when we came together to create music, we were like, well, we have to incorporate all of these things because uh, it's who we are and it just comes naturally for us. I should have added on to that. I know we were, I haven't really talked about this a lot before, but I should be honest that I, I also grew up in the Baptist church with my mom playing the piano and singing for the choir and that whole thing. So there is that inspiration in there as well for me. Now, where are you two from? Galaxy far, far yeah. away. <laughs> well, I mean, so am I. I mean, but I mean, no, I'm locally. Locally. Uh, I was born on planet New York. So I was born here in New York. I grew born in Manhattan, but grew up in the Bronx. And then at about nine years old, we moved to Maryland. So I have a bit of that Southern thing happening too. And, um, but I always knew, you know, I remember as a kid when we moved to Maryland, I was like, when I come of age, I'm going back to New York. And that's what I did. I was born in Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia. <laughs> Where I lived for a, what, 18, 18, 19 And, and then years. we escaped. <laughs> yes. We met in D.C. Um, around the time I went to college there, and then I moved to New York. So that was a vision that we both shared. Yeah. Um, although I had never real, I'd never lived in New York, I still, as a child, knew that New York was the place for me. And I think about even that. Like thinking back to Tina Turner and like those vid music videos and like me being able to see, oh my God, that's New York City. Like I knew that that yeah. was somewhere that I should be. So, Monster, you technically went from Williamsburg to Williamsburg. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Now, you know, for like a few weeks, I've had, um, it seems to hang on by Ashford and Simpson just like playing over and over in my head. And I was on your, your IG man child and I saw that on uh, one of the posts and I was like, man, this is how I know we're all gonna be in sync. Cause you know, that, that was playing. But um, speaking of your pages, I love the black queer history post that you put up. And I want you to tell everyone why it's so important for us to know those parts of history. Yeah, I mean, so as we spoke about, we're inspired musically by a lot of different people, a lot of different genres, but also we're inspired by a lot of different artists in different mediums, whether they're um, visual artists, photographers, um, fashion designers, architects, um, architects. Like we love, like one of the things we love doing when we're on tour is going to museums in the city that we're in um so when we have downtime like we just went to chicago chicago thank you <laughs> actually we performed at a museum uh, but when we had the day off we went back to the museum to see the exhibit because that really feeds our creativity those kinds of things mm -hmm. but all of that to say um we believe in passing it on we believe in um naming those names um and, and it's important, especially like times during like Black History Month, a lot of times in black, during Black History Month, we hear the same name. 
And a lot of those names are, are people who are cisgendered, who are straight, um, as far as we know. And so we thought, you know, we need to celebrate our folk, our folk meaning, yes, our Black folk, but also our queer Black folk who paved the way for us to be able to do what we're doing now. And um, the response to that has always been really positive because people don't know right. a lot of that history. And I'll add on to that, you know, it being important now also because of the attempt to try to erase history now again, where from some people, some folks where they, you know, want to, you know, remove books or whatever, you know, so it's good that, yeah, we have to, told. yeah, we have to do it. Ourselves. We have to do it orally, orally, you know, so anytime we're in the presence of particularly of younger people, um, we like to impart that knowledge and they're like, who? Yeah, you didn't know this person existed. There was, there was something before you, before us, and even before the person yeah. we named, you yeah. know? Yeah. You know, we're, we're all part of a continuum, right? So before us, you know, there were queer artists like Sylvester, Janine Stewart, um, all of those people that, that came before, I mean, shoot, before them, Little Richard, you know, right. and, and all of that. And we've always been like, especially like lockdown, watching all those documentaries oh my God, that's and YouTube videos. And um, just to feed, um, to, to feed us, you know, it's really, it's really um, nutritional, really, mm -hmm. as an artist yeah, to be brilliant. able to go back and, and see what came before and then be inspired to like remix it in your own way, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. right. Now this is what I want to know. I want to know how you two met. Tell that story. And, and monster, you can you can you can take that. <laughs> okay, I'll start it off. And sure. we'll bounce back and forth. <laughs> so, um, like I said before, I live in DC, and um, we we both were in DC at the time. And there was this party in DC that happened in the middle of the week. I can't remember the name of the party or the. It was a small venue. And it wasn't a queer party or venue, but it was um, it was house music. So it was like sexually ambiguous. You couldn't tell who was what, who was into everybody, because everyone was just there for the music and dancing. Right. Some of us were a little bit more obvious, obviously queer. I might have been like the one person in this <laughs> that was there. It was like... Clearly, yes, he <laughs> is queer. So um, I remember there was like an area on the side of the dance floor that was all, like you could be away from the dance floor because I tend to not be on dance floors. I like to dance near doorways or like in hallways, like on like away from the dance floor, kind of away from people where I kind of have space to like not hurt anyone or whatever. And so I was dancing behind this like, these bars, it was almost like being inside of a cage or whatever, but not in a cage, just dividing the space. And um, I slowly started to make my way over onto the dance floor just for a change, right? Which was kind of unlike me, but I'm grab I had noticed him earlier on and I'm dancing over towards like the middle of the dance floor. And I realized that he's also coming a little bit into the same direction. And because he was very um, straight looking, I wasn't at the sure point. what was happening, but I just kept dancing. And as time went on, I realized it was like, oh, wait a minute, he's actually facing me and we are dancing together. And once I realized that, I feel like we really locked into each other and we danced together for the entire night until the lights came up. Right. The lights came up. We, I said thank you. He said thank you, and that was it. We parted ways. I went back over to the side to like connect with my friend who I'd come with, and he went over to his best friend. Mm -hmm. And I, when I went over to the side, I was like, "Well, I don't know anything about him. I don't know his name or anything <laughs> like that." And I'm a super shy person, so I would never be the person to like 
be forward and like say anything to anyone, especially in the club, because as long as there's music playing, all I can disappear into dance world, right? So I got the nerve up to go back over to him and basically spark up the conversation to so that we could at least get each other's names and you can bounce off from there. I mean on your end. Yeah, that that's pretty much the story. Um what one part of it that did happen, once we parted ways on the dance floor and I went to my friend, um, my friend said, so who was that guy you were dancing with that whole time? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know who that was. She said, you don't know who that was? You didn't get his name? I said, no. And she said, if you don't go get his name and his number, I'm going to go get it for you. That's what she said. And so it was like, yeah, duh, because I was also pretty shy. And so um, as I turned around to go find him, he was approaching us. And that's when we started to have a conversation and we all all walked home together and we arranged to go on a date like maybe that weekend and we went on a date and that lasted from the afternoon early afternoon until the next day we just clicked now shout out to your friend what was your friend's name who made that suggestion makita harris shout out to makita (laughs) yeah but for making I'm sorry. We no, go ahead. No, no, no. We were both there with our best friends, and I should shout out um, Rita Jean Kelly Burns. I was there with Rita Jean Kelly Burns. She's the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> shout out to Makita, Makita Harris, right? Makita Harris? Yeah. And yeah. Rita Jean yeah. Kelly Burns. Shout out to both of them for making this all possible. Now, this is what I want to ask you. Was it an instant attraction, like right away? So again, what Monster said was true. This place wasn't um, a queer club. So you didn't go there thinking, oh, I'm going to hook up with someone. You went there to sweat it out, like in dance. It was like, you know, when I think of going to the club back then, it's more like church, you know? Um, So when I saw him, I thought, wow, it's really funky. Like he was wearing these wide leg jeans and had these piercings. And I thought, wow, really really interesting and And, platforms on like six inch platform yeah so (laughs) i thought it was attractive but i didn't think anything i didn't think anything past that to be honest i thought oh he's a great dancer let's dance (laughs) you can Mm -hmm. i think i i i was i was attracted to him but i was also in a place where um it was really about the dancing, I feel like, you know, connecting physically with someone who got who got where the language that I was speaking, basically, through my body. Yeah. Now, everyone out there may not know this, but you two just celebrated your 20th anniversary. So happy anniversary. What did you do? What did you do for your anniversary? Well, we should say that both uh Makita and Rita were there yeah. at our, our uh, celebrating with us this yeah. past, uh, this earlier this month. Earlier in June. And that was great. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had uh, multiple little gatherings, gatherings. with uh, close Dinner. people close to us. And um, we also had to work. So <laughs> yeah, we also worked that <laughs> That weekend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's been nonstop because it's Pride Month, you know. So celebrating and eating. Oh, we ate a lot. We, we, we're trying. We're working on that right now. We're yeah. trying to get off that. We, <laughs> that so, food is delicious, yeah. and you know, I know y'all did more than that because okay, I saw Revolutionary Love. All right, and that's some grown. <laughs> listen, y'all, that's some grown man love right there. Okay, you young ones better pay attention. All right, now listen. <laughs> on my show, we're for everybody, and I want you both of you to give our viewers and the listeners advice for maintaining a healthy, long-lasting relationship. Mm. Lots of laughter. That's true. I mean, not taking everything so seriously because challenges are gonna come. Mm -hmm. They're going to arise. And um, <laughs> that's when you have to hold on to each other and communicate and communicate. And um, also just realize 
you know, it helps to have a shared vision together as a couple, but also um, as individuals to understand how we can support each other in the visions we hold for our individual right. selves. And give each other space at the same time. It's like balancing those two things. And grace. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. I like that space and grace. Space, space and grace. That's a good one. That's a T-shirt. That's a new song. That's a record. Yeah, we may have some space and grace. Well, listen. When y'all make that record, we're gonna break it right here on the Chris David Show. Yes. So, just saying. Okay. And here's the thing too. I say with relationships, you have to like each other. You can be in love all day. You can love a person down, but if you don't like them. You're going to be miserable. The most important thing is the friendship. Friendship, yeah. And, and so when we met, the, the story we told you, um, we dated for a short while, but then we didn't. Um, but we remained friends. And that, I feel like, is what made the difference. That's, that made the strong foundation. So that by the time it came around again, we were ready for mm -hmm. each other, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we knew each other. You know, we didn't have to put on the um, the mask of we didn't have to audition for each other. Mm -hmm. You understand? You, <laughs> you know, you put on your best face and, you know, all of that. So because we were friends for so long, uh, we, we knew each other, you know, warts and all. So then when it came back to a, a romantic place, we were like, OK. Yeah, this this feels like I can be myself. Yeah. yeah. And if you love something, let it go. If it comes back, it's yours. So it works. Sure. It works. Yeah. Now, I want to shift gears. Um, man, child, and monster. How should someone who's serious about getting into the music industry as an artist pursue that in 2023? question because I feel like things have done there's been so much shifting within the past 10 years there's multiple ways now you know because we all know of those people who have become like overnight success based on their TikTok views <laughs> right um I would but, say you know just do it yeah if you're an artist if it's in your soul, in your being, don't think too much. Just do it. Do it because, you know, time flies. And um, if that is really something, I mean, you, you have to really want it because part of it is not just the talent. The other part of it is drive. Mm -hmm. The other part is business savvy uh in the especially nowadays you have to kind of know where you fit or if you don't fit right. acknowledge that and um you know tunnel vision and stay in your lane and do 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 focus don't dream it be it <laughs> the rocky part <laughs> perfect now Lately, there have been like these think pieces and these op-eds and social media ramblings about the state of Black music. What would you say to those who claim that Black music is on life support? Hmm. I've never thought of it as being on life support. I have heard um, people say R&B isn't what it was. And well, that it's I dead. Say it again. Or well, they've said that it's dead, that R&D is dead. Yeah, but I think that's only in the case. I mean, I, it's not dead. There are so many artists who, you know, don't get the shine right. um, that they deserve, That, but they exist. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not dead at all. Because we can, I mean, we know people, who, you know, that's you true, would yeah. love, um, but they don't have the um, backing you know, or the the numbers behind them. Right. Um, so you don't necessarily know who they are, but I don't think it's dead. I think that the industry 
in terms of, has changed like monster industry has changed said. and so now and there's so much of it out there that you have to really dig for what you want to hear you know you can't just accept what they're feeding you you have to take on that work right use your fingers <laughs> and and yeah, and, and, and make it work yeah do a deep dive because even what is considered known as the industry is feeling that themselves you know, so they're also having to figure out what do we do now that everyone has immediate access to their own success? You know, how does that work? So I feel like I was going to say earlier that it also feels like things ebb and flow like styles do, you know, mm -hmm. they come and go like every 20 years, you're back at the same place, but it's just shaped a little different and has a little extra touch or whatever, but mm -hmm. We're constantly experiencing things over and over and over again. So I don't think that it's gone. I think that it's just waiting for, to come back in. I mean, take house music, for example. Everyone was all like, wow, house music, house music. Like, it had gone somewhere. But no, nah, it hadn't gone anywhere. It was underground, maybe, for, for some people. Although for some of us, it wasn't even that. It was a way of life. It was yeah. something we heard constantly. So it's always been there. It's just you just had to go digging you had to know where to go to hear it you know mm -hmm. um that's all and i'm a big house head so i mean it has i've always listened to house music since i was a little kid and um we'll get to that a little later because there's a, a record that we're going to talk about but um I, that I yeah that yeah we'll get to that a little later. I don't want to jump ahead, but I I uh, I had Deanna Williams on recently, and I she is the overall mother of the culture. Okay, and we talked about the triple threat. Now, do you two think that the triple threat will ever make a comeback, or is the triple threat in fact still here? Hmm, these are good questions. <laughs> the triple threat. Um, I think it's I still think here. The, the triple threat is definitely here, and I feel like there's a lot more people that are triple threats now. Like, I think. I mean, yeah, it feels a bit like everyone works towards being a triple threat rather than focusing on one thing. Yeah, it feels like you you kind of have to in order to make a living and to, yeah, make a significant living. Mm -hmm. It feels like you have to do multiple things. I mean, there are some artists that do one specific thing, but for many, it seems like you you kind of got to do yeah. a little more. And, um, but I think there's still, even in the mainstream, when you think of artists, I mean, of course, the first artist that would come to mind is Beyonce. Yeah. You've got someone who's, a, awesome singer and awesome, awesome dancer, dancer that also acts yeah you know from time to time or um who else um Janelle Monet or um I think it, it, women come to my mind first um but there are other people we, the weekend is now acting, acting. on the mm -hmm. idol and uh you know and and producing stuff I think that's a, a Queen Latifah when I think of all of those people you know they realize they gotta you know diversify yeah you know, so I think they're there. I think they're still out there and I think it's still important. And of course, then you have all the people that do um, the artists that do Broadway and Vegas and those kinds of things that really uh, take the time to train and hone their craft and mm -hmm. uh, get out there and, and put on amazing shows with amazing stamina, mm -hmm. you know, an amazing budget. Okay, y'all listen, <laughs> budgets <laughs> diversify. Listen, money coming. We're gonna we're gonna manifest it. Money coming. Yeah. But you know, you mentioned Beyonce and this movie that she did. I really like. It was called Obsessed, oh. where the woman is like stalking her husband and and yes. she beats the shit out the lady. Yeah, it it comes yeah. on on the weekends and like whenever it comes on, I have to stop everything to just watch that movie because it's just such a good movie. I'm always coming up with theories, like just all the time. And I call this the potluck theory. And you know how, you know, everyone brings something to the potluck to ease the burden of the host. So, mm -hmm. and this was that in the 80s, 
you had Michael Jackson and he brought the constant content. Whitney brought the vocals and yeah. Prince brought the creativity. What do you think about that? Hmm. Well, what it sounds like you're alluding to is kind of a individual, um, individuality, really, right? Um, that's what I hear when I think. And, and uh, with, our, with the pop stars that we grew up on, it definitely felt like that. You know, they each were of equal, uh, not of equal, but they, they were they were here. Those people you you mentioned, they were the top, but they were all so different and so unique and had a sure. different point of view and were coming from a different perspective. And that's so important. And they each had a different sound, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like, um, it's not the same today. It's it doesn't feel to me. Maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like a lot of people ha are in the same lane. Right. There's time. a there's like a there's a template now. It's like okay, this is a template. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do that. Go, you know. And now five, six, seven, eight. Right. That's what it feels like. Um, and that could be, you know, someone brought up recently something about the American Idol. Uh, what's the uh, the voice? The voice and that of, kind of right. template of performance, right? Which is ultimately ahead. being shaped by. Well, now the viewers have a say in. The viewers have a say in like who 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 is who's worthy and who's not. Right. But then people start to emulate the things that have are considered successful, so they all sound the same. But you know what it is? It's as if the audience now has control of your creativity as opposed to it coming from you mm -hmm. organically or authentic authentically, you're actually doing something to get them to vote for you mm -hmm. as opposed to just being the artist that you are. And I think that that's lost a little bit in that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Totally get that, but listen, y'all be slaying us with all three, okay? Now, I gotta know, who designs these LaBelle-esque outfits I see y'all in? Like, who styles the albums? Like, I like the Astro Boy thing going on on the new album, we'll talk about that later, but who, who's doing all this? It's mostly Monster, to be honest. Really? But, um, Mostly, yeah. Styling wise, yeah. Mm -hmm. But Manchild stepped up quite a bit. Like, you know, we've gotten oh, to yeah. the point where we toss it back and forth, but initially, I, 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 I guess I was the one who kind of spearheaded that. Yeah. Yes, I have autonomy, of course, but um, we will <clears throat> find things that we like, and usually Monster will be the one to put it, put them together so that it it makes sense for us yeah and some and and he he's been making creating some pieces more so lately um we're about to do a video for um a track we have called plastic and um yeah, there's some stuff <laughs> happening in there. yeah, there's, there's something very interesting that he created for that. I mean, I guess what's happened is that I used to build stuff a lot more back in the day, and I'm slowly trying to pull myself back into that world where I'm right. actually creating the things rather than like, you know, picking and styling from other designers. But now, Monster, are you, a, are you, do you sew? Are you sewing? Um, I have sewn. Right now, I'm not really sewing that much. Um, I probably I will be sewing by the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the two of you being out queer artists. Like, what was the reception at first with that? I mean, so we, as Monster said, we each had our own kind of separate pro projects, band wise, and all of that. And um, so we've been out for a long time <laughs> creatively. Um, and the response has always been pretty positive. I mean, we we didn't, 
I'm sure that there were things said um, without us knowing, you right. know, and, and I'm sure that there were doors uh, that would have been opened or opened sooner had we not been who we are. Right. But um, the thing with us is we kind of live in a bubble. That's the best way to put it. It's yeah. like we just do us and um, we just do us. You know, it's not... It's funny, we just had a conversation right before this with a friend and um, we were talking about, um, <laughs> we were talking about a certain artist and um, I won't mention any names. You can mention it to me, I won't leave it in the interview. No, no. Oh, is that bad? Uh oh. <laughs> and in, the in the conversation, um, this this person is, is queer, but they, it feels sometimes like it's performative queerness like they wear it like a coat and I know who you're talking about okay okay we'll leave it like that they wear it like a coat and you know it it, it pops it, it rears its head when there's a new project a new project let's just mm -hmm. say that and it becomes more intense with each project you know and for us it's just like well everyone has their own journey and their queerness as individuals um it just feels forced. And with us, it's like, well, you don't have to make all those big declarations. I mean, yeah, we know who you, that you you come out as queer, but um, just be, just be, just you be. know? For us, when we walk into a room, we're queer. When we talk to someone on the phone, we're queer. When we're on a stage or in a DJ booth, we're queer. <laughs> you know, it's just, it is what it is. And you can take it or leave it, it's okay. We don't try to, you know, we you know, it, we just want to be who we are. We accept people as they are, as long as you ain't trying to hurt nobody. It's all good. Just be, you know, be. You know, um, that to me is when you really inspire people, as opposed to, hey, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this. Just show them who you are. One of the things we always say before we perform anywhere to each other. We say, show them who you are, meaning show the audience who you are. That is the intent when we go. We say, don't we? Yeah. Every, like every show time, them show them who you are. That's it, show them. So. I love that. Master, what do you have to say about that? Well, to piggyback off of what he just said about the artists in particular that we're talking about, I mean, I do, I, I agree, but I also um, have entered this space where the possibility of just allowing that artist to just sit in the place that they are, because maybe that's just the way that they have to experience it in order to get to the next place. You know what I mean? And so there's that. Um, like I said, everyone ex goes on that journey um, themselves, and we can't really dictate. No one should dictate how they how they experience or present what they're going through. Right, so. but you can feel energy. But the energy, <laughs> you know. yeah. But when you feel that energy, yeah. I mean, there. Yeah, we won't. Yeah, we don't need to. We would never say names or whatever, but there are a few artists that, you know, that sent Oh, but see, y'all, see, energy. they're sweethearts. They're not going to say names. I will. Okay. okay. But we're going to move on. Okay. <laughs> they're sweethearts. <laughs> we, we, we love them. They, these are our new friends. Like, they're, they're not messy at all, but I'm messy. I'm, I, I see what I have to say. But, yeah, camera. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk later. But you brought something up and you talked about journeys and and people having their journey through queerness and everything um i want to know man child what what was it like your first time going to the pier you said i went to the pier <laughs> <laughs> what do you think i was working when i saw you, <laughs> you saw me we're there? talking about pride and that that sort of thing oh you're okay. talking about oh right see the, see where you're fine um, you saw that, right? Yeah, I mean, wow. It was, um, yeah, I was much younger. 
And um, it was it was a lot. It was overwhelming, but in a good way, you know, because, you know, you grow up and you feel like in some ways you're the only one, you know, and by this time, you know, by the time we moved from New York to Maryland, you know, it was a different experience for me there because one, you, I grew up in the Bronx, right? It's black and brown people everywhere. That's what I knew. That was, my life was centered around black and brown people. But when we moved to Maryland, it wasn't that way. It's a lot more white people, less black and brown people. And, um, so, and then the queerness thing wasn't even a, an issue. Like there was, like I really didn't see any of that. Didn't have any real um, reference for it. So you know, you feel very isolated. You feel like, oh, you're the only one. And so by the time I got to college and started venturing out and and um, going to clubs and and meeting people and um, dating and all of that and going to prides. Um, and it's funny, I remember thinking, oh, I hope no one sees me here, you know, because I was still closeted, you know, and I didn't want people that I knew from my other uh, worlds to, to, to know at that time. And it's so, um, when I think of that time, it, wow, I think of, of that little, little boy, um, you know, I want to hug him because it's like, Wow, you know, so much has changed, not only in my life, but in the world. And thank God. Well, I mean, the thing that sticks out in my head or from what you just said was that idea of going through that time period of, oh, I hope no one sees me here. Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like I I never really had that. Um I sh I think that there were moments where I should have been thinking that and I and it never dawned on me like oh what if someone sees me doing this you know what I mean um so that was good and bad um but maybe not so bad because I had every right of just being you know in different places with my friends or whatever and it was up, up to everyone else who wasn't ready for that to catch up oh, you yeah. know I think you never bad at all yeah. Yeah. You were definitely farther ahead than I was as a youth, you know. So, all right. Now, Monster, <laughs> was there anything like, was there an equivalent to that back in Virginia that, like, that they had, like, where everybody kind of hung out, you know, hung congregated? Out. Yeah, yeah. For queer people? No. Yeah. Okay. I mean, The only thing, no, there was not at all. What I what I can say I had was my uh, like a, a cohort of friends that were kind of like the wild and crazy. We weren't considered queer at that time. It was like the new breed generation who hung out on the corner of this part of the hallway in high school, where it was like the gang of new breed folks who were like minded. And people talked about, but everyone was always curious to see what we had on that type of thing. Um, but you know, so it doesn't out, change basically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hanging out for me and Williamsburg consisted of going to Bush Gardens and going to all of the like musical review shows and riding rides. That was my hanging out until. I graduated from high school. Yeah. Now, what do you say to the young ones who are out here trying to figure things out? It's been said before. It gets better. You know, um, it really does. This is why I said kind of what I said when I when I think of the younger, the young person I was then I think, oh, I'd love to hug that little boy because at the time, I didn't know it would get better. I didn't know that you could carve out a life as a queer person for yourself. It was a very different world then than now. Now you can see it. There are 
living examples of it all around sure. uh, us. You know, even if you don't live in the vicinity of of uh, a population where there's a lot of queer queerness, um, you can certainly see it on television and in film and in magazines or online or or whatever. But when we were kids, it wasn't that way. So um, now, yeah. oh, go ahead. I will say though the 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 TV though MT music television music videos was the outlet to see people that were uh, like minded and different. But what I would say to them is yes, it gets better. Find your community as best you can. You know I know that's harder in some places than it is others, um, but find your community, you know, and if if you're young and you live with parents that, you know, you can't speak to, um, seek out a group if you can, seek out a meeting if you can, just so that you know you're not alone because there are other people out there and you might not know it. It might even be the person talking bad about you. It might be the bully. Sure. who's actually just acting out because they're going through the same thing. So yeah. find uh, find that community wherever you are and uh, find uh, support in that way. The other thing that's different today now from, you know, back in the day is if you are in an area where there isn't a whole lot going on, you you have access through um, the internet and like online communities, you know. Um, sure. So there's that. Now you both just dropped an album, Pandemonium, with Seven Davis Jr. An EP, yeah. an EP, and yes. it's a dope EP, by the way. I was listening to it earlier. I want you to tell everyone about it. So. Pandemonium EP is a collaborative EP between us and a producer that we absolutely love, Seven Davis Jr. Um, we were we were friends with um, the members of Soul Clap, and Soul Clap are a DJ duo, but they also have a record label. And we had been in talks with them about doing a project together for quite a few years. And uh, I remember Eli, who's one half of Soul Clap asking us, oh, well, who would you want to work with? And the first person we said was Seven, Seven Davis Jr. Yeah. And uh, we've just been a fan of his sound and 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 what he has been doing for, for years. Mm -hmm. So Eli made it happen. And uh, we recorded that, I guess, last year. Last year. It was really um, easy. The synergy between us was great. And uh, it was it was a joy, actually, a real joy to to work with all of them. Yeah. And so um, we're excited. We're hoping to see Seven again soon. And uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll be able to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Hope so. I mean, I, now I like those shook mixes because they're for different vibes. Like part two has yeah. like that party vibe, and then yeah. part one is like a nice Sunday drive energy. And I heard yeah. a little bit of Janet influence in there too. I did. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I'm like, I, I be, listen, I be, I be hearing stuff. But I like the plastic record that you did with uh, Nicodemus. What inspired yeah. that record? So Nicodemus is someone we worked with uh, before. We did Funk Bad with Atlas, which is a remix of uh, another, of an original song called Funk Bad. It's just different lyrically, but it's kind of the same premise. And, um, so we had always wanted to work with him again and follow that up. So he approached us and he sent in, uh, we did two tracks for his album. So Plastic is one of them. And uh, with that song, um, what we like to do, yeah, what we like to do with dance music, because in general, dance music is pretty light. It's the subject matter, meaning it's pretty light. Pretty light. You know, it, they're not, no one's really talking about anything specific. But um, what we try to do with our songs is um, tell a story or um, talk about something that means something to us. So with Plastic, it's kind of a um, commentary on uh, 
social media and fame and instant fame and um, incorporating a message that people can kind of like it'll provoke conversation. Yeah, yeah that's always the intention. And um, but at the same time, you can dance to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, we love it though. We're very happy with it. And it gave me very much pop life meets Jamiroquai. Oh, very wow. dope record. Yeah. Very we'll dope record. Yeah, okay. Them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And yeah. now speaking of um, funk, that something that I used to get in trouble for rapping the original as a kid who was in Catholic school and knew all the words, not to the radio version, but to the version version. Oh, so, okay. yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> what? Well, well, what made you want to reimagine funk that? Well, again, that was Nicodemus's idea. He approached us and said, you know, I want to remake Funk That. And um, he had another artist in mind, but then that, I think, fell through. And he approached us with the idea. And I thought, oh, this is it's right up our alley. It's perfect. And, you know, he gave us license to uh, create the scenarios that mm -hmm. are discussed mm -hmm. on uh, Funk That. And we had plenty to say. So... <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so it became a little more um, socially conscious than the original version in the things we discuss in Funk That. So, um, and at that time, a certain dude was running for president. And, you know, oh, yeah. So we put that hmm. in there. A certain dude who's about to be in prison, real prison, hard time prison. Okay. Fingers yeah. crossed. Mm. I think Fingers it's going to happen. Crossed. Listen, I've been I've been working the tarot cards. I think it's gonna happen. I think it is. Yeah. I've been working the tarot. Um, but who yeah. would you like to collaborate with though? Any artist, dead or alive? And and monster, I'm gonna let you start off with that. Oh, who would I like to collaborate with? Um, dead or alive, you said. I mean, I have to I can't let go of the fact that you know, I would love to collaborate with Prince. You know, that is, would be my first go-to. Grace Jones would be fun to collaborate with. Um, hmm. You got to know uh, you go. It's a thing. Of, uh, I feel like there's some there. There's an obvious one that I'm leaving out right now. So you go ahead and you go. Who's the obvious one? I'm I'm trying to think. I don't want uh -oh. to. Oh, you read something. I see. I see. Um. Well, Prince would. I mean, that. Yeah, that would have been incredible. Um. Woo. Um. Who else? Though. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of someone alive. Yeah. I mean, I love Stevie Wonder. It's my. Yeah, my personal favorite artist of any genre, you know, my favorite. I would be probably very intimidated to create something with him because I'd be in awe the whole time. But um, current artists, um, I mean, you know, uh, uh, more contemporary artists. Um, gee, I know that there are, there's terrible. so many, but now right now I'm drawing a blank. Grace Jones would have would yeah. be per Grace Jones okay. again. Um, oh, this thing. Um, this. Um, Nile Rodgers. Oh, that's a good one. Classic. That's a good one. Um, yeah, Nile. You know, we were we did a festival and he was uh, a headliner, and it was gonna it was our mission to, <laughs> to meet him. But it didn't happen, unfortunately, because, you know, I I can be very uh, aggressive <laughs> when it comes to meeting uh, people that we admire. So um, I'm looking forward to that day when we do get to meet him. A collaboration with Pharrell and Williams would be fun. Yes, Pharrell would be great. That's a good one. Yeah. Make it happen for, for Man, Child, and Monster. The Nile Rodgers collab, the Stevie Wonder, the Grace Jones, and listen, if when that, that Grace happens, y'all hit me up because I want to be there. I got to see that. Like, oh, my God. I want to be there for that because I love Grace Jones. Like, I, yeah, I got to yeah. be there for that. 
definitely. But now you two are going to be touring. Um, tell us where you'll be. Barcelona. Barcelona. Jesus. Uh, milkshake Festival. We go back to Ibiza in September, which we, we had a blast there the first time, and we're looking forward to doing that again. Um, yeah, those are the places I can think of offhand. We're doing Milkshake Festival, which is Amsterdam. Yeah, sure. And uh, and then of course you know when we're not away we'll be here in in New York. Yeah. And uh, Ibiza, that's uh, Sunday, September third, right? Yeah, Sunday, Gio, September third. Listen, coming. I would love to. Passport is ready, so. Oh, you would love it. It's so much fun. I mean, we only got we only got to spend um, one day there. This past visit. Hopefully, this next time we'll be there for a little longer. But we had such a great time, and those the people there, they know how to party. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I heard. <laughs> yes. And listen, that's in September, so you guys have plenty of times to get your passports and your tickets, and they'll be there with uh, Todd Terry, Dimitri from Paris, Melville Baptiste, Fulmore, and and more, and mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot of good house music. So you house heads, don't drag your feet. All right. I didn't even know all those people were. Right. <laughs> Listen, I I've been doing my research. Like I'm over here. I got notes. I got notepads and and everything. Like I yeah. So yeah, I'm I I was prepared for you all. Like I one prepared for all of my guests, but I was really prepared for you two because, like I said earlier. You're my first musical guest, and I love music. So, it, aside from being excited, like I had to be, you know, prepared for, for you. Um, but I have another theory. I have another theory. Because, like I said, I'm excited. Love music. Um, so, boom. It's about house music. And this theory is that house garnered such a strong following in Black gay clubs because a lot of Black queer people came up in church, knew the hymns and the rhythms, and just the overall vibe and the energy of gospel as being welcoming and uplifting, even when the Black church wasn't. What do you think about that? Well, you know, you're absolutely right, because I know personally for me, a lot of what ends up happening for me in a performance, even in our DJ sets, is rooted in gospel and the church. You know, my response to the rhythms and the melodies and the bass lines and to um, the overall vibration in the club or festival is rooted in what my experience was in church. Right. Well, yeah, as a kid, I mean, I wasn't fond of going to church. Um, it just didn't feel like a safe space for me, even before I knew who I was as a queer person. It just didn't, it didn't feel like home. But dancing to house music, disco, funk, in a club with an incredible sound system, with um, like-minded individuals who are there to fellowship, but also um, communicate to maybe whoever their spiritual deity is. Um, it it It's to me the closest thing I've ever felt to having the Holy Ghost, you know, it's, it's the one, mm, right. you know, what I've seen of the Holy Ghost in church. Right. So go ahead. Go ahead. No, so, so even taking it beyond the church, knowing that it's all rooted, you know, from, you know, whether it be like the African root or indigenous root, it's all all that it's the spirit. You know what I mean? So um yeah, and the spirit. And also the spirit of just unity. You know, we really love going to nightclubs and, and spots that have a bit of every walk of life in it, you know, because 
we're supposed to exist together. Right. That's what it's, you know, here for. And um, unfortunately, we don't always see that outside in our world, mm -hmm. you know. But in a club, you know, you're seeing people from all walks of life just united and fellowshipping under the house music and, and just letting go of all of these other barriers that keep us apart. Mm -hmm. And that's inspiring. And that's what we want to bring whenever we perform, whenever we're, whether it's DJing or live performance or a mix of both, that's the energy. That's, that's the energy we want to give into the world. I want you to let everyone know how they can get in touch with both of you. Well, Monster has a 1-800 line. <laughs> 100, come out in. <laughs> We're going to drop that right there in the video, too. <laughs> no. Um, you can follow us, the illustrious Blacks, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we don't always respond to a DM. It depends on what it's about, <laughs> but uh, you can. It's generally it's pretty good at responding. We, we do our best. And um, yeah, and it's just good to keep up with us on there. We're, we're, we're about to have some more merch. Mm -hmm. Our Suck My Disco. Show it off, Mom. There you go. There you go. And uh, yeah, okay. okay. You said what waste? <laughs> See? This is what we're working on now, like literally right the day <laughs> we're working on our, our e-commerce site and we'll have this like my disco t-shirts as well as our illustrious blacks logo shirts and uh more that we're working on so yeah and we're also working on our album so we will have an album <laughs> we've been working um now really consistently on it and um uh, we Maybe hope, by the end of the year. Yeah, fingers crossed that that will be the case. We, I, I know, me personally, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and everyone out there, it's uh, The Illustrious Lax. All one word on Instagram, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, if you look up Monster Black, it's Monster is spelled M-O-N-S-T-A-H, all right? So that's M as in money, O as in OMG, N is in Neptune, S is in Saturn, T is in Titan, A is in Astro, H is in Halcyon. And when you hit them up, be respectful as you would to the financial aid office issuing your refund. All right? All right. Because, listen, I don't want to have to come after nobody because I like y'all a lot. I don't want to have to come after nobody because they're talking reckless. Um, what's in your playlist, though? Oh, you go first. I have to think about that. I mean, for me, to be honest, I listen to a lot of old stuff, <laughs> older stuff, classics of 80s, 70s, 60s, um, 90s, all of that to get inspiration. Um, but of course, because I'm DJing, I'm also listening to house and new disco and sometimes techno and just listening to things to put into our our shows that make sense. Um, but yeah, I listen to a lot of older stuff. So you, you know, you you're more so um I'm trying to think of my, my go-to listen. Um, because I and I looked at my phone and the last thing that was on there was ESG Moody. I like the internet and, and, and mm -hmm. great. Um ooh, what else have I listened to lately? Um tend to like when it's current, more um, stuff that fuses soul and electronica. So um, anything that, that, that's that got a bit of that, um, that vibration, I like. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I like, like I'll, you know, Addy Oasis pops into your mind too. Like, oh, we love her. Her sound. Yeah. Um, Oh, so yeah, yeah. Takes the killer is great. Mm -hmm. Um, we got a shout out, of course, the queer black folk. Yeah, takes the killer. Um, oh boy, 
Moses something. Moses. Um, zebra cats, all of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, you gotta shout out those. I had a moment of, I, I, I had a moment a couple of days ago where I went down through, um, Jante had some stuff on, um, what was I listening to? On, um, not SoundCloud, um, Spotify. Mm -hmm. And so I had a Jante moment a couple of days ago. I mean, right now in mine, I'm still doing from like a few weeks ago. I'm still doing um '90s female R&B. So SWV, Brownstone, Jade, Baz Noir, Good Girls. Yeah, so that's what's still it's going on in my good. playlist. Mm -hmm. I don't know who was SWV fan. What was the battle? It was uh versus was then Escape. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, no, you know, Escape. That's fine, but SWV, yes, exactly. that. that my yeah, friends. those are my girls. Like, I still probably have like all of their CD singles, and I mean, kids. There was there was a thing once upon a time called CD singles. So yeah. I have like all of their CD singles, all of their posters. Like, I was a, a huge, huge, huge fan. Now, you two may not know this about me, but mm -hmm. I too am an Afrofuturistic magical Negro. Okay. And I have a time machine. And now Man Child and Monster Black, if you had a time machine, what would you go back and tell yourself in the past? I would go back and tell my younger self to focus on the business and build the strong foundation to build your creativity on top of that. <laughs> I would tell myself uh, it's going to be all right. Not even that it's going to be all right. It's going to be great. Hold on. Hold on. Before we go, I have to shout out the good sis mugger for putting me on to you. She spoke so highly of you. She was on the show about a month ago. Um, make sure you all go check out our interview. Um, but yeah, I had to shout her out. Um, do you have anything else coming up that you'd like us to know about? Uh, what else is coming up? The album? Yeah, we're working on a show. Working on a show. A full-length show. Uh, and we are working with a director slash writer, and Nigel. And um, we're looking forward to presenting uh, at least a bit of that work in November at Joe's Pub here in New York. Mm -hmm. So that, that'll be a taste of it um, with the idea of it being in its full fullness in 2024. Let's go. The illustrious Blacks on Broadway. It will be an experience. Jazz -in. I, I love that. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's going to be such an experience. Like, I just, oh my goodness. But look at this. We got the Blacks closing out Black Music Month. Yeah, All right? You. Man, child, monster. This has been fun and truly an honor. I'm so glad we were able to do this. And I, I look forward to seeing more of you both. I mean, you know, possibly, you know, performing on my talk show stage. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, but be there, and yeah. I have to shout out all of you for watching and listening to the Chris David Show. Tell your friends, tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your baby daddy, tell your boyfriend, tell your sister, tell your cat, tell your dog, tell your doctor. Tell everyone who's black, who's proud, and who loves black music to follow us on Instagram at Chris David TV and follow our show at The Chris David Show on Instagram and YouTube. You can also visit chrisdavidshow.com. There you'll find everything you need to know about the show. Now be kind and be good.